Kokoro, it's become this monolith of D&D culture. What started as a home game for a bunch of nerdy ass voice actors over time has turned into one of the most popular live stream shows ever. Critical Role's first broadcast debuting on March 12, 2015 on Geek and Sundry. Fast forward eight years later, and Critical Role is still going strong in their third campaign. You see, for as great as Critical Role is as a form of medium and storytelling, it does have one really glaring weakness for newer viewers. It's really freaking long. I mean, really long. For context, Critical Role is currently on its third campaign in eight years. The first ran for 115 episodes, most episodes taking anywhere between three to five hours to complete which comes out conservatively to somewhere around 350 to 400 hours of showtime, and this is just for campaign one. <laughs> yes, all that juicy D&D content is a bit intimidating at first for a potential new viewer to chew through. So that's why today on Fraud on the Telly, we're gonna be speedrunning Critical Role campaign one. Obviously, I highly encourage you all to watch the entirety of the campaign on your own, yourselves, but join me today as we speedrun Critical Role campaign one. Our story begins on the world of Exandria, in the continent of Tal'Dorei, a region ruled over by sovereign Uriel Tal'Dorei and his family. Enter our main characters, the adventuring group Vox Machina, the cunning and agile twins Vex and Vax, the not-so-holy gnome cleric Pike Trickfoot, the brilliant inventor and gunslinger Percy Dorolo, the womanizing gnome bard Scanlan Shorthout, the awkward half-elf druid Keyleth of the Air, Ashari, and finally, the hulking, cheerful Goliath, Barbarian, Grog, Strongjaw. Shortly before the game was streamed, Vox Machina had freed Sovereign Uriel and his family from the influence of demonic forces. As such, the group were awarded a spot on the Tal'Dorei Council, a position of honor and political power. Not long after these events, one of Tal'Dorei's greatest magic wielders, the Arcanist Alora Vysorin, would petition Vox Machina to travel to the underground city of Craghammer to rescue the missing paladin Lady Kima, who had been sent there to investigate some strange creatures. The party venture into the Underdark to track Lady Kima after they defeated a strange abomination and oversized Hydra, after traversing deep into the subterranean caves of the Underdark and befriending a mind flayer named Colorota, the party barely managed to save Lady Kima, who was being held prisoner by a group of dwarves known as the Duragar. The party pushed deeper into the Underdark, coming across a mind flayer city that has been completely overtaken by this evil Kavarn, who is revealed to be a beholder, juiced up with the power from the Horn of Orcus. The party managed to barely defeat Kavarn, taking Kima and the Horn of Orcus, fleeing the Underdark from the hordes of Mind Flayers. From here, our party and Kima make their way to the holy city of Vasselheim, one of the oldest cities in all of Exandria, and the center of spiritual worship on the continent. After delivering the Horns of Orcus to the Temple of Bahamut, the party find themselves wrapped up in the business of one organization, the Slayer's Take. This organization takes out contracts to destroy dangerous and powerful magical creatures in the area. The party teleport back to Tal'Dorei in their castle Grayskull Keep. There, they are greeted by a fellow Tal'Dorei council member, Seeker Assume, who informs them that Sovereign Uriel will be holding a grand feast in one week to honor Lord and Lady Briarwood of Whitestone, in celebration of a bridge being built between the continent of Wildmount and Tal'Dorei. After Assume leaves, Percy, who looks distraught at this recently learned news, informs the party that he is the true heir to the nobleship of Whitestone. He tells them that Lord and Lady Briarwood are responsible for the death of his entire family, the two nobles having wormed themselves into Lord and Lady Dorogo's good graces, only to unleash an army, slaughtering Percy's family and many of the townspeople. The Briarwoods managing to spin a tall tale to the rest of the world that the Dorogo family had died from illness, died from a disease, and had left Whitestone for them to guard. Percy, you see, has been waiting his entire life to get revenge on those who destroyed his family, his home, those who tortured him. His anger and lust for revenge helping him concoct a weapon of mass destruction, the first firearm in the world of Exandria. Our party attend the feast, donning their best clothes. Vax investigating the Briarwoods' room while the rest of the party 
do small talk at the dinner table. Unfortunately for Vax, though, he is caught red-handed by the Lord and Lady as he suddenly finds himself paralyzed, unable to move, as Lord Briarwood walks up behind him, sinking his teeth into the rogue's necks, revealing that he, Lord Briarwood, is in fact a vampire lord. Vax attempts to fight his way out of this small room, jumping through the window, falling several floors down to the courtyard below. As he does so, he mutters the word Jenga into his telepathic earrings, informing the rest of the party that something has gone wrong. The party rush outside to Vax's aid just in time as a grand battle begins to take place against Silas, the vampire lord, and his necromantic magic-wielding wife, Delilah Briarwood. The Briarwoods put up a strong fight, but seeing the odds are stacked against them and looking to keep their facade of this Lord and Lady of Whitestone alive, the two eventually escape, teleporting away. Later, Asum meets with the party, informing them that he believes Sovereign Uriel has been placed under a charmed spell by the vampire Silas. The party, after some deliberation, deciding to venture to Whitestone to clear their names and to discover what horrors have taken place in Percy's hometown. On the journey, Keyleth begins to worry about Percy questioning him on his recent behavior, as since their encounter with the Briarwoods, Percy has grown more angry and violent. Percy tells her that inventing his gun was a mistake. It just happened one day when he had finally decided he would take revenge. Percy is unaware of this at the time, but in this moment when he created his firearm, Percy made a contract with a shadow demon, a revenge demon, Orthax, for the hidden knowledge to create said firearm each barrel of the gun being etched with a name, a name of a soul that Percy must claim for Orthax. As the party venture closer to Whitestone, the landscape begins to change. Things become dark and ominous, an unknown fog permeates the forest, and the once lively city now sits cold and silent. The once healthy giant tree that sits in the center of the town, known as the Sun Tree, a tree that was said to have been planted by the sun god Pelower, is now barren of all leaves. The party stealthily enter the city, dodging patrols by massive undead zombie giants and those loyal to the Briarwoods. They make their way to the center of the town, coming closer to this giant tree. There they see eight bodies hung from said tree, all of which have been dressed up to look like the members of Vox Machina, an obvious warning from the Briarwoods. Over the next day, the party concoct a plan to overthrow the Briarwoods. Their plan is to incite a rebellion amongst the townspeople by systematically attacking and removing the Briarwoods' most powerful allies within the city. All the while, Percy growing more and more erratic and violent with each Briarwood conspirator that was killed. With the city in chaos, the townspeople rally to the flames of rebellion, led by their once thought dead prodigal son, Percy Dorolo. Percy learning life-changing information that his sister Cassandra, who he once thought was long dead, is actually alive, being held by the Briarwoods in the castle. With the streets of Whitestone littered with fighting, Vox Machina used this as a distraction to enter the palace through a secret entrance entrance that leads into the dungeon. There they find an old woman, who they learn is Anna Ripley in disguise, a scientist and one of the Briarwood conspirators who personally tortured Percy. Ripley, with no other option, informs the party that she was put in charge of the Briarwood secret operation, the construction of a ziggurat, a pyramid temple-like structure beneath the castle. The party push through the castle, taking Ripley with them, eventually finding and rescuing Percy's sister, Cassandra. Here an epic battle would take place between Vox Machina and the Briarwoods, Silas using his enhanced physical abilities and evil enchanted blade to carve up members of Vox Machina, while Delilah rains down powerful magic from above. Eventually though, the party would manage to get the upper hand, as the magic wielder's been utilizing sun magic to damage the vampire. Delilah screams out in horror as the love of her life, Silas, is ripped asunder by the beams of sunlight. With tears running down her face, Delilah quickly ascends the ziggurat where she begins the ritual, splattering her own blood upon a small black orb as she begins muttering an incantation. Suddenly, the walls begin to come to life, as in horror, the party realize that the walls of this cavern have been laden with the bodies of the dead. Suddenly, though, the orb, which was spinning rapidly, shrieks down to the size of a dime as Delilah yells out, No, the ritual supposedly not working. Scanlan racks his memory, informing the party that it's possible this ritual was linked to the entity Vecna, also known as the Whispered One, a great mage who attained lichdom and sought to attain godhood in the distant past. As they speak to one another, Percy begins to feel a rage boiling inside of him, smoke beginning to pour from his body. 
Suddenly, Percy pulls the gun from his back, a voice in his head telling him to kill Delilah, as the smoke from Percy's body begins to coalesce behind him into a strange, hulking form. Orthax, the shadow demon who made a contract with Percy, has finally revealed itself. The party managed to defeat the demon Orthax, Delilah being stabbed to death by Cassandra in the chaos, Scanlan destroying Percy's pistol in a vat of acid as a final puff of smoke rises from the green goo. Some time passes. One day though, Vox Machina are summoned to the Cloudtop District for an important announcement from Sovereign Uriel. Here, Uriel announces that he will abdicate his throne. From henceforth, the Taldauri Council will rule in his stead as the Taldore Republic. Suddenly, though, warning bells begin to ring out throughout the city. They look up into the sky to see four massive dragons of different colors, white, black, green, and red, descending upon the city, destroying buildings and killing innocents as they go. Chaos rings out as the dragons destroy the city, Vox Machina attempting to fight back, though they quickly realize that they are no match for these dragons. The party manage to escape to their castle on the outskirts of the city. Here they meet with Alora Visoran, one of the most powerful magic wielders in Tal'Dorei. She informs them that the largest dragon of the four, the red dragon, is named Thordak, and that Alora and her adventuring party years ago had sealed Thordak away in the elemental plane of fire. With the city of Iman in ruins and now occupied by ancient dragons, Vox Machina begins to flee with a number of refugees to the city of Whitestone via teleportation magic. From here, our party then teleport to the holy city of Vasselheim once more in search of allies and information returning to the Slayer's Take. The party are then taken to meet a gynosphinct named Osisa, an ancient entity which serves the goddess of knowledge, Ayun, and looks over the Slayer's Take. The Sphinx then reveals to the party that in order to stop these ancient dragons, they must claim the Vestiges of the Divergence ancient weapons wielded by champions of the gods in an ancient war long past known as the Calamity. The Sphinx informs them should they seek these weapons, they should venture into the mountains to meet with her mate, who will be able to reveal the locations to them. The party continue to journey through Vasselheim, obtaining more knowledge and allies, Grog learning the location of one of these vestiges, a set of leather armor that was once worn by the Raven Queen's champion, the Goddess of Death, which lies in a tomb that has sunken beneath a lake not far from Vasselheim. The party set out for the tomb of the Raven Queen's champion, eventually coming upon the coffin of said champion, the Death Walker's Ward armor, the vestige resting inside. Percy, in his haste to claim the armor, reaches out and touches it, setting off a blast of necromantic death energy that emits from the coffin, hitting Vex, killing her where she stands instantly. Vax in horror rushes to his sister's side, who lies cold and dead on the ground. The group quickly attempt to perform a resurrection ritual, Vax holding his sister in his arms. He looks up, seeing a floating visage of the goddess of death before him. In anger, he shouts out, Take me, you raven bitch, as the form slowly drifts towards him the figure vanishing as breath again fills Vexalia's lungs. From here, the party venture back to Whitestone, catching their breath once more. As time passes, the party have learned that this group of dragons is known as the Koma Conclave, and they have spread their violence and domination out across Tal'Dorei, taking a number of cities under their control. One such of these cities being Westrin, which is currently being ruled by the Black Dragon Undersill and is occupied by the Herd of Storms, Grog's barbarian tribe. Weighing their options, the group venture to meet Osis's mate, another Sphinx who tests the group. The party eventually passing, to which they are awarded the Vestige Myth Carver and Legendary Sword for Bards. As well, the Sphinx reveals the locations of the other mini vestiges. With two vestiges now in their possession, the party decide to take some drastic action. They set their sights on the next vestige, the Titanstone Knuckles. The party hoped that by defeating Kevdek, Grog's uncle, they could free the city of Westrin from the control of the Barbarian, and potentially Grog could motivate the Herd of Storms to fight against the Black Dragon Umbrasil. The party decide to set a trap for Kevdek, Grog boldly challenging his uncle in one-on-one -on -one combat while Vox Machina wait in hiding. The battle quickly goes poorly for Grog, as Kevdak is extremely powerful and aided by the power of his vestige, the Titanstone Knuckles. Grog is quickly overwhelmed. 
Suddenly, a massive battle breaks out as the rest of Vox Machina enter the fray, Kepdak's many barbarian warriors joining in as well. In a cinematic, intense moment, Vex manages to save a wounded Grog in her pocket plane necklace, the half-elf flying high up on her broom and releasing the barbarian from said necklace as Grog flies down with a heavy swing of his axe, cutting Kevdak in two. With Kevdak slain, the herd of storms quickly turns, coming to support Grog as he claims the Titanstone Knuckles. Vox Machina quickly putting a plan together to defeat the Black Dragon Umbrasil. Percy devises a great metal trap, which they will use to ground the Black Dragon, as attempting to defeat an ancient dragon that has use of its wings is nigh impossible. With the trap set, Vox Machina and their allies wait for Umbrasil to land to claim its tribute from the city. As it lands, the trap is sprung, hooks being dug into the dragon holding it into place as the barbarians spring to action. Umbrasil does take some heavy damage, though it manages to free itself from the trap, taking flight and unleashing a torrent of acid breath onto the battlefield. The dragon, though, begins to flee back to its horde in the mountains to recover. Our party now regroup pursue Umbrasil into its lair for one final standoff, eventually slaying the black dragon, the first member of the Chroma Conclave now dead before them. After a lengthy trip to the Feywild, a reunion with Vex and Vax's estranged father, and a formidable encounter with an emotionally manipulative Archfey, Vox Machina again returned to Whitestone, having claimed the vestige. They then make their way to the continent of Marquette in pursuit of yet another vestige, Cabal's Ruin, to the city of Ancarel. Here, though, they are surprised to discover that the former owner of Cabal's Ruin has been killed the vestige taken. But unusual was the nature of the woman's death, as her body had been rizzled with puncture wounds, seemingly bullet holes. This could only be one person, Anna Ripley, who the party have discovered has been scrying on Percy through a pistol he has carried, which he took from Ripley back in Whitestone. After scrying on Ripley, they deduce that she is chasing another one of the vestiges, the Dagger Whisper, and so the party set out after her. Eventually, Vox Machina come face to face with Ripley once more, though this time she wields Cabal's Ruin and has made a contract with a familiar smoke demon, Orthax. After an intense battle, Vox Machina managed to defeat Ripley, but it was at the cost of Percy's life. The next day, the party venture back to Whitestone, returning Percy back to life. The next morning, though, the party would be greeted by their ally, Seeker Assume, who suddenly reveals themselves to be the green dragon Raishan in disguise. Raishan comes to Vox Machina with a deal. She will help them defeat Thordak, but in return, she wants to take Thordak's body. The party reluctantly agree, setting their sights now on the White Dragon Vorigal, as they believe with Raishan's aid, it will be a much easier fight. The party return to Draconia, launching a surprise attack on Vorigal. With Raishan aiding the party, they manage to slay the White Beast, claiming another vestige, the Spire of Conflux, in the process. With just Thordak remaining, the party prepare for the final battle, making a quick trip to the City of Brass in the Plain of Fire to recover one final vestige. After returning, it's then they realize that Vox Machina must take the fight to Thordak, who has burrowed deep beneath the Cloudtop District, which now seems to more resemble the caldera of an active volcano than a city district at all. In an epic battle, Vox Machina and their allies descend upon the City of Emon, Vox Machina cutting their way through the Cloudtop District into Thordak's lair our heroes fighting valiantly against this colossal ancient dragon, eventually badly wounding the beast as he attempts to fly deeper into his underground lair. Vax pursues though, remembering the voice of his mother in his head as he stabs Thordak, dealing the final blow. Before Vax lay hundreds of Thordak's red dragon eggs, his true plan revealed. However, this was not the end. Vox Machina would turn on the dragon Raishan, refusing to uphold their end of the bargain, the green dragon letting out a barrage of spells against our heroes. Ultimately, Raishan would escape with parts of Thordak's body, the party pursuing her over the next few days to her lair, where the last member of the Chroma Conclave would be killed, though it would come at a cost. Scanlan would be brutally killed in the battle. After an emotional resurrection, Scanlan is brought back to life, but the trauma of the last few months was too much for him. Scanlan decides he will leave Vox Machia, heading off with his daughter Kaylee to Marquette. Here, Vox Machina would enter a state of calm. A new member would join their group, tarrying Darrington, and after a series of adventures with Terry, he would head off on his own path, wanting to start a brigade of adventurers all on his own. 
This time of peace would come to an end, though, as Scanlan would return to Whitestone in disguise, telling Vox Machina that he has discovered another strange ziggurat like the one under Whitestone, this time, though, on the continent of Marquette. The party then travel to this ziggurat, where they view a few of cultists performing a ritual. They stare on in horror as in the center of the ziggurat stands a familiar figure, Delilah Briarwood, as another spinning orb sits before her. The party quickly try to stop her, but it's too late as Delilah steps into this orb, vanishing from sight. The party reconvene in Whitestone. After some research, they believe Delilah has vanished into the Shadowfell. Using necklaces they took from Vecna cultists, the party jumps into the orb, transporting them into the Shadowfell. Here they see an ancient broken city, which looks like it was the site of a great battle. Undead men shamble to and fro, some wearing the signs of the Dawn Father, others wearing cultist robes. After ambushing a group of cultists, they learn that they are in the city of Tharmphala, and that Vecna is slowly being reformed at the Tower of Entropis, the great tower in the center of the city. Suddenly though, the entire city is teleported to the Prime Material Plane, somewhere within Exandria. Realizing the direness of the situation, Vox Machina sees no other option but to assault the tower. Unfortunately, though, it's too late. As the party fly to the top, they see three figures standing before them. A Death Knight, the Lila Briarwood, and the newly reborn Vecna. This fight goes horribly wrong for Vox Machina. Grog being banished to the Shadowfell, Vex dying to Powerwood kill, and Vax being disintegrated. Though Percy manages to kill Delilah as Pike resurrects Vex, Grog returning from the Shadowfell just in time as Keyleth plane shifts the party, minus a fallen Vax, to the Feywild. Vax dead comes face to face with his patron, the goddess of death, the Raven Queen. She offers him a choice, eternal rest that she says he has well earned, or the chance to return to life, to aid his friends and family as her champion. But once Vecna has been defeated, he must return to the Raven Queen to serve her for all eternity. Vax accepts as back in the Feywild in the middle of the night, Pike sees and naked Vax come walking out of the forest, now revived as a revenant. Looking for direction, Pike reaches out to her goddess, Saren Ray, who tells her that Vecna is seeking to ascend to godhood, and that he looks to use the Ritual of Seeding, a forbidden ritual that was used by the Raven Queen to ascend to godhood. She tells them to visit Pelor, to learn how to seal Vecna away should he ascend to godhood. Vox Machina travels through Elysium, the plane of the gods, coming to face to face with the Dawn Father. After completing his trial and receiving his blessing, the god informs them how he once sealed the chained oblivion in the Calamity. He tells them of the Prime Trammels, devices which the goddess Ayun created to seal gods in far off planes. After another series of trials, Vox Machina manages to find the goddess Ayun, who tells them of the rites of banishment, and explains how they must construct the Prime Trammels by using the strength of a titan to combine platinum with a bead of divinity. Vox Machina ventures to the Divine Forge, creating three of these Prime Trammels. However, Vecna has succeeded in his ascension to Godhood. Reconvening with their allies, Vox Machina sets out once more to save the world. Flying out, they see before them a sight of true horror, a colossal Earth Titan, once long dead from the early days of the Schism, revived in an ancient undead form. Atop this colossal horror sits the city of Tharimphala. Again, the party make their way through Fire and Fala until they discover a familiar ally, a tall red dragonborn known as Archon. Archon explains how his party was attacked and left for dead by Delilah, but by the grace of his god Tiamat, he lived, and now he wants revenge. Vox Machina ascend to the top of Entropis, where floating before them is the Whispered One, the god of secrets, Vecna. Vecna would summon a swarm of meteors, crashing them down into the city of Vasselheim below, sundering the city as Vox Machina attacks. Joined by their many allies and ancient tools of legend, as well as a little bit of luck, Vox Machina managed to bind Vecna with Pelor's divine trammels, as the newly formed god is vanished to a far off realm. Here ends the broad story of Campaign 1, though the stories of the characters from Campaign 1 live out in the world of Exandria, as this world continues to live and breathe in the background throughout Campaigns 2 and 3. But in fear of any potential spoilers, we're just gonna leave the story of Vox Machina and our characters right here. And yes, this was Critical Role Campaign 1, the speedrun. I know it was still 
pretty long, but to be fair, we just managed to condense down 350 to 400 plus hours to what, like 20, 30 minutes max? As always, if you enjoyed the video, write something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. As this was a speed run, it was impossible to include every little detail from Critical Role Campaign 1. Though if you do think I missed out on some pretty big major details in this speed run, feel free to drop them in the comments below. As always, guys, I hope this video helped, and I helped it introduce some people to Critical Role Campaign 1. Though I do have to say, there is no substitute to actually watching the campaign yourself, which I highly, highly encourage. If you did enjoy this video, then why don't you check out some some of our other Critical Role in D&D content, like why you should watch The Legend of Vox Machina, one of the best animated series I've seen in a long time, the Critical Role animated series. As always, guys, I hope to see you in the next one. Stay safe out there. Until next time, peace, love, auto.